Welcome good people, my name is Joel Collier and today we're going to talk about the difference between formative versus reflective indicators in structural equation modeling. So some of the issues that uh, we need to kind of think about really is the difference between uh, unobservable constructs that are captured through what we call reflective indicators and unobservable constructs that are captured through what we call formative indicators. So let's say we've got a construct here and the construct is called ease of use. So we ask customers uh, how easy it was to use a, a piece of technology. And so we gave, gave them a survey and we ask them four questions, ease one, ease two, ease three, ease four. Now this is what we would traditionally see in capturing a construct is we have an unobservable construct and the arrows, if you will, are reflecting or pointing, you know, to these observable indicators. Uh, by far, this is the most common type of uh, measurement model. You know, with this type of measurement model, too, you're talking about it's the unobservable construct is really kind of responsible for explaining kind of the variation, if you will, in its indicators. And again, it's kind of reflecting it. The construct itself uh, within its indicators is there's an assumption that its indicators are positively correlated with one another. So they're all somewhat um, trying to kind of move all in the same direction to try to capture the ease of use construct, if you want to think about it that way. And so these kind of traditional validity concerns are important to assess, you know, are you really capturing ease of use, such as reliability, unit dimensionality, discriminant validity, convergent validity. They're all meaningful tests when it comes to measuring reflective indicators uh, with constructs. The other thing that you need to think about, too, with reflective indicators is there is an assumption that with reflective indicators that if I delete one of these indicators I'm still retaining kind of the the meaning of the of the unobservable construct itself so if I had four kind of ease of use uh, items and I deleted one of them well I'm still retaining kind of its meaning with the other three still being present um, and that's going to be really important here when we get to the difference between uh, formative versus reflective indicators and which ones should it actually be with formative indicators, you now see that uh, the path from the indicators to the unobservable is in the opposite direction. So now the influence flows kind of from the indicators to the unobservable construct. Sometimes they'll refer to them as causal indicators. It's really, that's probably kind of a misnomer. Uh, it's more of just the term called a formative indicator itself, but it, in essence what happens is is these indicators itself are kind of specifying um, the unobservable, and really it's more kind of an index, if you want to think about it, or a summative index, than rather than a scale, kind of like it was in the reflective indicators. Um, and these indicators that are supposed to be formative of that unobservable observable construct it's supposed to really contain the full meaning of the unobservable construct so even with reflective you may be like well it's going to capture the majority of it but with formative indicators there's an assumption that you're capturing kind of the full meaning of the unobservable construct with those indicators um, and so one of the other things too that's really kind of different about this is with formative indicators there is not an assumption that they're all positively correlated with, you know, with each other when we're talking about the indicators. Actually, you can have a, a indicator that is actually negatively correlated with the others because it's an index. So they're all kind of contributing different parts to kind of form, if you will, this, this concept or this construct. And so with formative indicators, these traditional tests of validity that we're used to in the past or reliability and convergent discriminant validity, well, they really kind of fall apart because if you have, well, for instance, in this instance, ease of one going in an opposite direction of ease two and three and four, well, A, your reliability is going to be really monkeyed up. And then you're talking about, you know, the validity of the convergent validity, like it doesn't want to converge and maybe the unidimensionality is even kind of problems. And so you can see, 
you know, where those traditional tests for reflective indicators would be real problematic with formative indicators. Well, they really have their own kind of test. They don't really go by the assessment of those kind of traditional validity tests. So there's really four areas of concern for validity with formative indicators. So again, they're not necessarily concerned with the reliability and the, those traditional validity concerns. They're really concerned with one is content specification, which means did you specify all, enough indicators, you know, to fully capture the concept? Because it's supposed to again represent the full meaning of the unobservable. So did you specify enough indicators, if you will, to actually capture that? Uh, kind of tied to that is indicator specification. So you know, when we get into kind of higher order constructs, you may be specifying from a content specification. Well, there may be, let's say, five, you know, uh, unobservables that really form kind of this higher order concept. Um, but within each one of those, you know, kind of first order constructs, are you asking enough questions to fully capture it? Do you have enough indicators there? Are they single indicators? Because it seem, seems like you're not going to have enough indicator specification then to say that I'm fully capturing it. The third thing is really indicator collinearity. Multicollinearity is really a big issue when you're talking about with formative indicators too, being essentially kind of problematic in, in assessing its co contribution to the kind of the, the concept. And then lastly is external validity. Does this apply to multiple settings outside or maybe just one? But really when you're talking about it's capturing its full meaning that they, it should have some kind of external validity uh, to that. So it's a little different in what they're concerned with from a validity standpoint. Now I'll say the vast majority of questions about is this formative or is this you know reflective is usually based around the idea of higher order models. A higher order model is where you have an unobservable construct uh, that is being uh, defined, if you will, by a, a level of unobservable constructs. So to give you an example of this, so let's say I had a concept here called unique experience and this was basically out of kind of a restaurant setting. So we wanted to ask people like how unique was your experience when you came here? And what we had determined that it was really kind of encompassed out of two things, which was were they surprised sometimes during the experience and did the employees there show some empathy towards them? So if they had some kind of component of surprise that was there and they felt like the employees were very empathetic to their, uh, their needs and whatnot, then it kind of contributed more to this idea of a unique experience. Now you can see in the slide right here, like this is the, the way that for the most part, even when I was in the, uh, the doc program many, many moons ago, back in the early uh, 2000s, this is how they were basically telling us to form um, the higher order concepts. So in, in essence, it was like this higher order concept of like unique experience would be reflected in the first order, you know, unobservable constructs of surprise and empathy. And those first order constructs would be captured through indicators, usually by survey items or something else. And that's how we it would traditionally look. And so it wasn't until about 2004 five or six where you really started to see kind of the shift kind of taking place uh, and there's a lot of good research out there too that kind of talks about you know the criteria of what is formative what is reflective but then they started kind of getting more and more research to just think is this conceptualized correct because the the biggest issue that people were coming out of this is is like well wait you said one of the main criteria for a reflective construct is that I can delete one of the reflective indicators of it and I still retain the meaning itself. So in this instance, with unique experience, if I delete one of its reflective indicators, say empathy, well now my entire concept changes you know, so let's say if I had more than two, let's say I had five constructs in here. Well, if I delete one of those constructs that's a reflective, kind of unobservable first order, well, then the whole, you know, higher order construct itself changes. And so, they were, you know, there was more and more kind of debate about this. 
until it really, for the most part, the, the argument was, is like, you know what, you should really never have a second order construct that has a reflective first order construct. From a theoretical perspective, it should never happen. In essence, what should happen is, is they should be formative. So those first order constructs should be formative to a higher order construct. Now saying that, these first order constructs that are down here, those are still reflective though. Now you can see in the, you know, they're reflective of their indicators. So the most appropriate way to actually kind of handle higher order constructs was, is that you're capturing these first order constructs reflectively, but the second order construct itself was going to be formative. Um, and the the issue was really, well, okay, you know, well, how do I do this? You know, because there's some issues, really, when you start getting into higher order constructs of like, you know, getting into the structural model side of what do I need to be concerned with? Well, initially, people were just simply concerned with the measurement of uh, these higher order constructs and the CFA itself. Um, and, and really, from a measurement perspective and even a confirmatory factor analysis, you're really only concerned with the first order. Right? So in this instance, I'd really only be concerned with surprise and empathy in testing a confirmatory factor analysis. Right? So, because a confirmatory factor analysis is concerned with those, again, traditional validity concerns, reliability, convergent, discriminant validity, all of those things. And so really, those things really only apply to these first order constructs that are reflective of their indicators. Your, your first order to your second order are really treated more like structural relationships because they're formative in that standpoint. So they would not necessarily be included in a confirmatory factor analysis. You would basically just look at the first order. And then when you moved into the structural relationships, then you would include that in there. So the empathy and surprise to the higher order construct would be included in that uh, analysis of the structural relationships. And so the other thing that you have to kind of think about too, um, and I spend a, a, quite a bit of time in my book uh, talking about this is some of the concerns that you have to deal with with higher order constructs and the biggest one is identification and you almost have to take on the term is called a mimic model uh, which is you know probably outside the scope of this particular video but if you're looking for more information about you know higher order models formative and re reflective indicators and ultimately um, just more information about when to use it, when not to use it, and how to actually test this structural model, uh, specifically in Amos, then I'd encourage you to check out my book because there's a lot of, you know, step-by-step -step kind of walkthroughs through that process itself. Uh, but if you saw value in this uh, video, I'd ask that you uh, like and subscribe. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all I got this week. Uh, I uh, hope you all have a great and safe uh, week.